This is CBN News Watch. Thanks for joining us for this special holiday edition of CBN News Watch. I'm Mark Martin. Today we take you back in time to the year 1914 in Belgium. That's when the spirit of Christmas overcame the bitter conflict of World War I. Enemies became friends for 48 hours along a 27 mile stretch of the Western Front. Here's John Jessup. To the glory of God. Each year, Andrew Hamilton lays a wreath at the World War I monument in his small English village, a tribute to the grandfather he barely knew. What do you remember of him? I just remember an old man who shouted a lot uh, because he was deaf and he uh, lost his hearing really during the First World War. So he was really quite frightening. And then uh, when I read his diaries, I was amazed, I suppose, at the, um, the, the life that he'd been involved in. This one is, is the original one which he would have kept in his top pocket. As Hamilton writes in his book, Meet at Dawn Unarmed, his grandfather, Captain Robert Hamilton, kept diaries from 1913 to 1950. Most years were fairly mundane, with one remarkable exception, 1914. Wednesday the 5th of August, wire to mobilize at 5.30 a.m. Hamilton was part of the initial wave of British troops in what came to be known as the First World War. The general consensus at the time was the fighting would be over by Christmas. Just one day earlier, German troops had invaded Belgium, and then England joined the fight. Ironically, the leaders of the opposing sides were first cousins. Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II and King George V of England. Caught in the middle, the tiny country of Belgium. This very provincial, rural area of Belgium was almost at, at the center of the world attention. I grew up listening to stories of elderly people in my village that had to do with the war. German troops cut a path of destruction through Belgium into France. Allied forces stopped them outside of Paris, pushing them back, but only so far. A stalemate ensued, with both sides digging in, literally. Trench warfare on the Western Front had begun. September the 18th, several men killed and wounded in the trenches by shell fire. This was, without exception, the most miserable night ever spent. I stood all night in water up to my ankles and the rain pouring down. This is one of the original trenches from more than 100 years ago. Two parallel zigzagging lines built by the German and Allied forces stretching more than 450 miles. In some places, the opposing armies were only 50 yards apart. Both uh, parties have, have uh, dug in and the cold is, is coming in. And so all of a sudden, the first enemy is, is not your opponent to the other side of the no man's land, but it's the cold. By the end of November, there were over one and a half million casualties on the Western Front. As the stalemate continued, it became clear the war would not be over by Christmas. The outside world pushed for an official Christmas truce, including Pope Benedict IV, who asked, that the guns may fall silent, at least upon the night the angels sang. British General Horace Smith Dorian, however, issued a directive forbidding fraternization, saying it destroys the offensive spirit in all ranks. December the 24th, we marched up to our trenches, a little downhearted to spend Christmas Day in them. Artist Bruce Barron's father was machine gun officer in Captain Hamilton's Royal Warwickshire Regiment. He recounted his war experiences in the book Bullets and Billets. I remember at the time being very down on my luck about this, as everything in the nature of Christmas Day festivities was obviously knocked on the head. But the Germans didn't let war stop their celebration. They displayed Christmas trees in their trenches and on December 23rd held a church service and a bombed out sugar refinery. School teacher Kurt Zemisch served in the 134th Saxon Regiment. Like Hamilton, he kept a diary during the war. We sang the song, This is the day that the Lord has made. 
The celebration moved many to tears. I think Christmas in those days was uh, much more an important festival um, in, in the German culture than it was in, in uh, French or Belgian or, or uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. I ordered my men that on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day, no shots were to be fired from our side if it could be avoided. Then something extraordinary happened. No sooner had we settled into the trenches, we and the Brits tried to draw attention to each other. The spirit of Christmas began to permeate us all, and we tried to plot ways and means of making the next day, Christmas, different in some way to others. An Englishman called over to our trenches, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, to which I replied to him and his comrades, thank you very much, I wish the same to you. After months of vindictive sniping and shelling, this little episode came as an invigorating tonic and a welcome relief to the daily monotony of antagonism. On Christmas morning, I woke very early. It was a perfect day, a beautiful, cloudless day. December the 25th, a day unique in the world's history. I met their officer and we arranged a local armistice for 48 hours. As far as I can gather, this effort of ours extended itself throughout the whole line as far as we could hear. It's Christmas time, uh, the soldiers under his command have had a rotten time and he was deeply Christian himself, so it was natural to allow it to happen. So started the Christmas celebration, the celebration of love when enemies became friends for a short time. Here they were, the actual practical soldiers of the German army, there was not an atom of hate on either side that day. Although fighting continued on most of the Western Front, the unauthorized truce extended along virtually all of the 27-mile length of the British line. Both sides helped bury their dead. They exchanged gifts like food, tobacco, and buttons. And in some sectors, they even played soccer in no man's land. It makes them happy because they feel human again. Whereas the industrial warfare of, often reduces them to cannon fodder, often reduces them to killing machines. This was all so beautiful, yet strange. I will never forget this Christmas celebration. The last I saw of this little affair was a vision of one of my machine gunners, who was a bit of an amateur hairdresser in civil life, cutting the unnaturally long hair of a docile German. A very merry Christmas and a most extraordinary one. But I doubled the sentries after midnight. There would be three more Christmases on the Western Front before the war came to an end, but nothing quite like this would ever happen again. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle later described it as one human episode amid all the atrocities which have stained the memory of the war. John Jessup, CBN News, reporting in Flanders, Belgium. Welcome back to News Watch. After two tours of duty during the second Gulf War in Iraq, a man named Lucas suffered with post-traumatic stress. It haunted him for years, and one Christmas, it nearly cost him everything he held dear. For Lucas, a husband and father of two, Christmas is more than a holiday. It's a reminder of everything he loves and everything he almost lost. Our unit would find an IED almost every single day. So every bump you're going on, it's like, is that IED? Is that IED? You don't know which person is gonna throw a grenade at you. You don't know which vehicle's coming at you to blow you up. And I'm like, I don't wanna die up here. Long before he was a Marine, Lucas dreamed of serving in the military. As a kid, I watched Rambo. I was like, oh, cool. He was tough and he could take care of himself. I pictured myself like that because I had to figure out things on my own. The youngest in a broken home, Lucas grew up a loner, always afraid that one day he'd become like his father. We'd always heard stories that he had murdered people and that he was going to try to kill us. Seriously, my old dad wants to kill me? That's pretty messed up. 
and then the thoughts would get to me. He was an alcoholic, drug addict, so I always thought in my head, oh, I have this addictive personality as well. Maybe I would kind of turn out like him. So he prayed every night, hoping he'd be saved. I read the Bible every day. I knew that it talked about sin a lot and that you can go to hell for sinning. So I repented my sins every single night. That just brought even more fear into the mix. At 18, he joined the Marine Infantry. As a patrol driver, he didn't see much action until one night when his squad was attacked. I just wake up to these tracers over my head and just machine gun fire and just bullets flying everywhere and you don't know where it's coming from. It was like, God, please help me now. Then everything stops. And that was like really frightening for me. Shortly after that, I started noticing that my memory was going, and I was getting more fearful, angry, and the vigilance would just get up, and I'd be paranoid. My way of escaping was suck it up. You know, that was like a motto, suck it up, everything. You know, you're tired, hungry, cold, don't show it. You know, it's weakness. And when he returned stateside, he began self-medicating. Something was missing, and there was something off, and so I, I drank to cope with that. I would drink every single day. Just before his second tour, Lucas married Ashley. He hid his symptoms and drinking until shipping off to Fallujah as a team leader ready to train Iraqi soldiers. But upon returning home to Ashley, he could no longer bury his fears. If there was like a cardboard box or debris on the road, he would swerve like a madman because he thought that there was a bomb underneath it. If we go to a restaurant, he had to sit in a place where he could see the whole room in case someone was going to attack us. I started having nightmares, and I was sweating. I always had my hand on my knife, even in church. Like, I'm playing out in my head how I'm going to get to this guy and stab him, like in church. I knew immediately that he had PTSD, but he didn't believe me. Back to that whole Rambo thing, he could take care of himself. I can take care of myself. So I don't need anybody helping me. I've got it. The only thing I could do is pray. I was like, God, please just have him be aware of it. Please. Eventually, Lucas agreed to counseling where he was diagnosed with PTSD and medicated. Four years later, he was working as an insurance manager, raising twins, and still battling PTSD. To cope, he began drinking more, but his symptoms only intensified too proud to ask for help and ashamed, I guess. The person that I didn't want to become was kind of who I was becoming. Then one night, Lucas got drunk at a Christmas party. When Ashley refused to let him drive, he lost it. He grabbed my hair and he smashed my face in the middle council. I just was screaming for him to get out. I just wanted him out. It was over. Lucas took off and Ashley drove home. The next day, he had no memory of what had happened. Then, Ashley confronted him and left with the kids. I basically just turned into my dad. I was heartbroken that I did that and that I screwed up the family. And um, on the Christmas tree, there was a picture of my kids and I looked at them and it just like melted my heart. So I said to God, I said, you know, I screwed this up, but if you can fix it, I'll give it to you. Lucas quit drinking and sought counseling. And for the first time in his life, he felt no fear. It felt like a peace. And I was kind of infatuated with this peace, like, this is pretty nice. Just gradually, I could tell that things were changing. And when Ashley spoke with Lucas on the phone, she noticed something was different. He dramatically changed, and he had like this confidence that everything was going to be OK and God was going to take care of it. And it made me angry because I'm like, you know, I'm divorcing you. Like, you've ruined our whole family. Like, this is not OK. And finally, I got on my knees, and I cried out to God. 
God, you have to do something. It's like I felt a break and I just knew that God had fixed it. I could love him again. Together, Lucas and Ashley learned to trust God and each other. And through that trust, Lucas has found freedom from fear. God healed me. He needed me to let go of myself and just to fully trust in him. God was the only way. There's nothing else out there that can really fix your marriage, your life, your heart, your mind, like God. If you really do surrender yourself and yield to God, He will restore things and make them better than they've ever been. Jared and Ashton were facing hard times and the holidays were right around the corner. So how could they afford to buy presents? Only through the miracle of Christmas. Army combat medic Jared enjoys the holidays with his family. He doesn't take it for granted when he's home because he's deployed multiple times throughout his career. Once he was gone for a year, Jared is quick to point out that he couldn't do his job if it wasn't for his wife Ashton taking care of their four children back home. I've always known in my heart and soul that they are completely fine and that she is doing a great job taking care of them, which is the biggest relief for especially a soldier in the Army. The couple has managed fine on Jared's Army salary. They live debt-free and always budget to give to others through their church. But that would change when they learned that some good friends were having legal trouble and needed Jared and Ashton to take in their two children until they sorted things out. The boys needed a home immediately. We had to make a decision in that moment or else they were gonna be put into the foster care system. And we knew the boys and we did not want that to happen. We loved them. It was a stretch to make it work with six kids. They had to begin buying necessities on credit. It was very hard on our paycheck. We were trying to figure out, well, how much money do we need for groceries? I mean, some days we were sitting there going, are we gonna be able to feed everyone today? After several months, the children were able to move back home, but by then, Jared and Ashton had thousands of dollars on credit cards. They prayed about a strategy to pay off the debt. For starters, Christmas would be very lean. There's nothing that Jared and I can do about it except for pray. And I, I have total faith in God that he's bringing us out of that right now. God is always going to provide for us, and he will always make sure that we make it to that next step, um, especially with our finances. Their situation took a turn when their church, Bethel Community, teamed up with CBN's Helping the Homefront to bring in some holiday cheer. Pastor Richard Dixon told them CBN was going to help. They really want to bless you. You wouldn't believe how much they want to bless you. <laughs> they actually want to give you $6,000 to pay off the debt that you guys have incurred. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's a lot. I don't, oh even, my know, gosh. I don't even know what to say to that. Thank you. God is good. That's amazing. And Pastor Richard told them CBM was also taking them shopping to buy Christmas presents for their children. I mean, thank you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> thank you, thank you, God. I mean, <laughs> wow. this is definitely going to change everything for us. I mean, even just last week, we were talking about how we're going to get out of this credit card debt, how long it's going to take us. This is going to fast track us to where we need to be so that we can get right back on to giving to others. Then it was time to go shopping. Jared and Ashton are forever grateful for helping the home front, getting them back on track. This is gonna change everything for us. This is gonna set us right back on course to being completely debt free. I'm so thankful for CBN and all that they're doing for us. This is really gonna change our lives. The holidays looked pretty bleak for the Kennett family. Then help arrived just in time. Coram Kennett served five years in the army as a combat medic. His wife, Mackenzie, is quick to praise him for his dedication to serve. He has a very big heart, and when it comes to helping people and, and his patriotism, I'm always so, so proud to be his wife. Coram speaks just as highly of Mackenzie for taking care of their toddler, Hunter, and newborn baby, Mason. I admire her. She's strong and I'm strong, but we're stronger together. Their strength was tested when, just before the holidays, Coram was denied reenlistment due to troop downsizing. I worry a lot. It's my job to take care of my family. 
I feel like I'm not doing my job, that hits me pretty hard. Corm and McKinsey decided to use their final army transfer from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to go back home to Wisconsin. There, Corm could find a new job, but the couple was already behind on bills and rent and couldn't afford a deposit on a new place in Wisconsin. It's very scary going into the holidays, not knowing where we're going to be. We've decided that we're not going to buy gifts for each other this year. The couple relied on their faith in God that things would work out. They continued to pray every day. We both feel so much better after we've prayed, after we feel like the, the Lord has listened to us and, and God's gonna handle it. I want her to feel peace of mind and I want us both to feel peace of mind within the marriage and with God. The Kennets got a dose of Christmas cheer when their small group leader with Reboot Ministry contacted Helping the Home Front. Leader Brian Flannery told them CBM was paying off their back rent and paying the deposit on a new home in Wisconsin. Wow. <laughs> what are you feeling like hearing that? Relief. <laughs> Relief. Wow. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't even know what to say. We're also going to sit down today and all the back bills that there are, we're going to take care of those too. <laughs> wow. God is good. <laughs> all the time. All the time. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> we wanted to make sure that you could give those boys the Christmas that they deserve. So, right here, our gift cards. Oh my gosh. And as soon as we're done, we're gonna go shopping. <laughs> Thank you. I can't even process with that, that we're, that we're gonna be okay. Then they were off on a shopping spree to buy everything the family needed, including presents for the children. We couldn't be more grateful for the blessings that y'all are giving us and knowing that we're gonna give our boys, you know, a wonderful Christmas this year. It's such a relief. That's awesome. That's gonna do it for this edition of News Watch. Have a great day.